cave. You can bake a cake or some brownies or cookies or whatever you can do. We just want to go out in the neighborhood, knock on doors, let people know we're here. Something <coughs> Lynn said that the night he came over, he said, most people don't even realize you're just a building sitting here in the neighborhood. They really don't know you. But we need to let them know we are a family. We're here and we want Amen. you to be a part of it. Amen. Amen. So if you'd like to be a part of it, you got any questions, just see Brother Robin, all right? Amen. God is so good. Amen? Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited this morning. Are you excited? Amen. Yes. Amen. I'm believing God we're going to come in one more. We're going to leave a different way. Yes. Amen. We'll give a shout out to Facebook and YouTube. First of all, we appreciate everyone being with us. We appreciate your prayers. We appreciate your support. A big shout out to Gene and Fred in San Antonio. They're faithful, they watch us, they support the church. Denise is in Alaska, and she supports the church, and she watches Amen. us, and Montgomery, and the kids in Africa. So we want to give a big shout-out to all those that are joining Amen. us this morning. Amen? Amen. Before I get started, before we do our, our confession, I missed it Wednesday night. Amen. That's you. They said we're going to have bad weather, so I called off the service. It didn't rain. <laughs> I got up the next morning, hand-washed my pickup, and then it rained. <laughs> what is the deal? Where was the rain when I was supposed to show up? Anyway, so that's off on me, guys. I'm sorry. I say I canceled it. Thought it was going to have severe weather, and we didn't. All right, let's hope for a Bible maker confession. Say it like you mean it, mean like you said. This is the word of God. This, this is, is the word of God. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I have. I can be what it says I can be. I can, I can be, be what, what it says, says I can be. And I can do what it says I can do. I can do, do what it says I can do. My mind's alert. My mind's alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. I'm a winner. I'm a winner. Not a winner. Not a winner. I'm a doer. I'm a doer. Not just a hearer. Not just a hearer. I said I'm a doer. I'm a doer. Not just a hearer. Not just a hearer. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody, turn it behind you next to you and say, Thank God you brought the rest of my body this morning. Thank God you brought the rest of my body. Now tell somebody, God loves you, and so do I. God loves you, and so do I. We love you, Pastor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we do love you. We love you, Pastor. I love yeah, you. Oh, love you. Yeah. 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 Okay? You will be blessed. You will see yourself as one of the participants in this play. It's all about different people, different walks of life. We put it on years and years ago. We had it on VHS, had it changed over to a, a DVD. But I promise you, you'll see yourself in there. It's got a message. Until you get a few laughs, Jerry had blonde hair back then, too. So. <laughs> All right, turn with me this morning to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. The Bible says, Mary, hard, good, good, like medicines. I got you some medicine this morning. Mary, these are just humor stories, so please don't be offended. <laughs> Two men were shipped up near an island. When they landed ashore, one of them began screaming and yelling, We're going to die. We're going to die. There's no food, no water. We're going to die. The second man leaned calmly against a palm tree. When the first man saw how calm his friend was, he, he went crazy and shouted, Don't you understand? We're going to die. Undisturbed, the second man replied, You don't understand. I make $100,000 a week. Dumbfounded, the first man looked at him and asked, Well, what difference does that make? We're on an aisle with no food and no water. We're going to die. The second man answered, You just don't get it. I make 100000 a week, and I tie 10% of that 100000 a week. Wherever I am, my pastor is going to find me. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, I want people to know the pickle lot. Robin and his wife, Jeannie, went to the state fair every year. Every year, Robin would say, Jeannie, I'd like to ride in that helicopter. Jeannie always replied, I know, Robin, but that helicopter ride is $50, and $50 is $50. One year, uh, Jeannie and Robin went, up, went to the fair, and Robin said, Jeannie, I'm 85 years old. If I don't ride that helicopter, I might never get another chance. 
With this, Gene replied, Robbing that helicopter ride is fifty dollars and fifty dollars is fifty dollars. The pilot overheard the couple said, Folks, I'll make you a deal. I'll take both of you for a ride. If you can stay quiet for the entire ride and not say a word, I won't charge you. But if you say one word, it's gonna be fifty dollars. Well, Rob and Gene agreed and they went up. The pilot did all kinds of fancy maneuvers, but not a word was heard. He did his daredevil tricks over and over again, but still not a word. When they landed, a pilot turned to Robin and said, By golly, I did everything I could to get you to yell out. I'm impressed. You didn't say a word. Robin replied, Well, to tell you the truth, I almost said something when Jeannie fell out. But you know, $50 is $50. <laughs> <laughs> Robin said, Well, that's one. See, some of y'all need some humor this morning. Amen. A keynote speaker was in such a hurry to get to the venue that when he arrived, he sat down at the head of the table. He suddenly realized he'd forgotten his dentures. Turning to the man next to him, he whispered, I forgot my teeth. The man said, no problem. With that, he reached into his briefcase and pulled out a pair of dentures. Try these, he said. The speaker tried them. They're too loose, he said. The man dug around his briefcase again. Here, try these. The speaker tried them, responded, they're too tight. The man didn't seem taken aback at all. He dug around his briefcase again. Here, I have this pair. Give them a try. The speaker smiled. They fit perfectly. He ate his meal, gave his speech without any further trouble. After the event concluded, the speaker went over to thank his benefactor and return the spare parts. I want to thank you for coming to my rescue. Where's your office? I've been looking for a good dentist. Oh, I'm not a dentist, man replied. I'm the local funeral director. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Church, before we go in, Father, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I pray for this morning for allowing us to have this place to come to worship you. And Father God, I want more than just a meeting, more than just a sermon this morning. We want an encounter with you. We want your presence, Father God. With you, we can do all things. Without you, we can do nothing. And this morning, Father God, help us to have that encounter. Help us to enter into that place with you, Lord God. Help us receive your word as truth and that we apply that truth in our life and it changes us, molds us, shapes us into your image, Father. That we can walk in the victory that you already won for us, Lord God. And Father God, we just give all these cares, all these things over on you, Lord God, and we trust you this morning. That you have your will, your way, and your word be manifested. And I give you the praise, the honor, and glory for it in Jesus' mighty name. All right. Joshua chapter 6, beginning verse 1. And read this to you from the Living Translation. It says, The gates of Jericho were kept tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelis. No one was allowed to go in or out. But the Lord said to Joshua, that Jericho and his king and all his mighty warriors are already defeated, for I have given them to you. Your entire army is to walk around the city once a day for six days, followed by seven priests walking ahead of the ark, each carrying a trumpet made from a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you're to walk around the city seven times with the priests blowing trumpets. Then when they give us one long loud blast, all the people are to give a mighty shout, and the walls of the city will fall down, then move in upon the city from every direction. Amen. You know, church, there's a lot of things that don't make sense. Why does lemonade have imitation flavoring but furniture polish contains real lemon juice? Why do we park in a driveway and drive on parkways? Why is it that when I transport something by car, it's called a shipment, but when I transport something by ship, it's called cargo? Why are wise men and wise guys opposites? Why is it someone tells you that there are a billion stars in the universe, you'll believe them, but they tell you you a wall has wet paint, you have to touch it to be sure? (laughs) Why do a fat chance and a slim chance mean the same thing? Why is there no egg and eggplant, no ham and hamburger, neither apple or pine and pineapple? I said, some things just don't make sense. How can the weather be hot as hell one day and cold as hell another? (laughs) Why do your feet smell and your nose run? If love is blind, why is lingerie so popular? Why is it called the TV set when you only get one of them? Why is it when you're driving and looking for an address, you turn down your radio? 
Why is it called quicksand if it takes you down slowly? Why are boxing rings square? Why do they sterilize needles used for lethal injections? Why do people ask you? Can I ask you a question? It's not like you have a choice. They already did. True. What's a free gift? I thought all gifts are free. Why is it called a building when it's already built? Why do we see take me out the ball game when we're already there? <laughs> Why do the light switches say on and off? When it's on, you can see it's on. When it's off, you can't see the read. <laughs> if Congress is the opposite of pro, is Congress the opposite of progress? Yeah. Why isn't there mouse flavored cat food? Isn't it, isn't it a little unnerving that what doctors and lawyers call what they do practice? Why do people long for eternal life when they don't even know what to do on a rainy Saturday afternoon? Why do we call this planet Earth from 90% of its water? I said some things that don't make sense. Last one. The biggest scam in life. Paying taxes on money you make, taxes on money you spend, and taxes on things you own that you already pay taxes on with already tax money. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Amen. Listen, most of us don't want to admit it, but more often than not, God's instructions don't make sense. That's because God is not a sense God, He's a faith God. And the question this morning I want to talk to you about is what do you do when God doesn't make sense. What do you do? Joshua 6 said, the gates of Jericho were kept tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelis. But the Lord said to Joshua, Jericho and his king and all his mighty warriors are already defeated. Say already. Already. Already defeated, for I have given them to you. I said, the battle's already won. I've already taken care of this. It's already yours. He said, all you've got to do, and here's your faith part, here's your obedient part. God said, I give it to you. Now this is what you've got to do. He said, your entire army is to walk around the city once a day for six days, followed by seven priests walking ahead of the ark, carrying a trumpet made from a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you're to walk around the city seven times with their priests blowing their trumpets, and then when they give one long, loud blast, all the people give a mighty shout, and the walls of the city will fall down. That doesn't make much sense, does it? For one thing, it's hard to keep people's mouths shut that long. He said, walk around the city. Don't say anything. Don't you know the people... Up on the walls of that city, we're looking down at them thinking, you idiots. You're walking around the walls. You got a mighty army out there, but instead you're walking around the walls, you're blowing a ram horn. <coughs> My question is, how many times has God told us to do something that didn't make sense? Amen. And how many times did your friends or your family? Or people you work with look at you and laugh at you like you were stupid doing what you're doing. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know, there has been times in my life that God's told me to do something that didn't make sense. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, I don't want, I don't know if I want to answer that or not because I don't want God to think I'm not trusting him or I'm doubting him. Or maybe you're thinking to yourself, I don't want to ask that because I don't want to sound unspiritual. Well, I'm going to answer for myself. Yeah, there have been many times God's told me to do something that didn't make sense. And maybe I should clarify that. There are times when God is saying to me or telling me to do or telling me where to go or telling me what I shouldn't do. That just doesn't make sense. In other words, it isn't logical. It doesn't fit into my this is how I do it box. 
I'm going to say something right here. Most of the problem that the children of Israel had with, with God was the fact that so many times what God told them to do did not make sense. Many times God directed them to go in this direction or to do this thing, and it just didn't make any sense to them. When God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, instead of taking them on a shortcut, he took them a long way around and led them directly to the Red Sea. That didn't make any sense. You're going to leave me out of here, out of the wilderness, and you're going to take me to the Red Sea, and then I'm blocked off, and i got nowhere to go. Ten different times the children of Israel angered God through their stubbornness and through their rebellion, and it was basically because God didn't make sense to them. In Job 19.3, ten times you have reproached me. You are not ashamed that you make yourself strange to me. I'm no expert, but I've come to believe the most important thing in the heart of God concerning his children is this. One, he wants to be believed, and two, he wants to be trusted. <coughs> Listen, faith is when you praise God in the storm, you trust him in the valley, and you follow him in the dark. Amen. The highest kind of trust, the highest kind of faith is when you don't understand, but you still trust him. I say this all the time. Even when you don't understand God's way, trust God's heart. Yes. Because God wants the best for us. Amen? Amen. And sometimes he'll direct his children to do things that don't make any sense. The Bible says he'll use the foolish things to confound the wise. How many times you thought you figured God out and you found out you didn't figure God out? <laughs> and how many times he done something and used somebody that you thought there's no way but God turned something around and made it work for Amen. good. I tell you this all the time. God has a sense of humor. When he says he used the foolish thing, because I'm very introverted and I don't like to talk that much. And he put me behind a pulpit to preach. I said he uses the foolish thing. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Sometimes I can say that God doesn't make any sense to me because it seems like he's not doing anything about my problems. Sometimes God doesn't seem to make sense to me because he asked me to do something that hurts my pride. If the question is, is there ever a time when God doesn't make sense to you, my answer is most of the time. Did it make any sense for Naaman that he should go dip in a muddy river called Jordan and they should be completely cleansed of leprosy? Jesus could have told him to go wash off in all these clean rivers, but he said, go dip in the muddy Jordan. And Naaman's like, hey, wait a minute. Kind of, do you know who you're talking to? Why can't I go over and do this? But God told him, Go do this. And he did what God told him to do, even though it didn't make sense, and he was healed completely. Did it make any sense for the children of Israel to get up every morning and go out and walk silently around Jericho, except for the blow of the ram horns once every day for six days, seven times, and on the seventh day, then to shout? It's got to make, that's got to look foolish looking. They're, they're marching around the walls, they're going around the walls, they're not doing anything, just walking around the walls. I say, the people on the wall, the people in Jericho have got to look down and think, you idiots. Did it make any sense for Peter to go fishing and to get money to pay his taxes out of a fishing mouth? Did it make any sense for Jesus to spit in the dirt and make mud and put it on a blind man's eye and then send him to a cross town to wash it off? Did it make any sense for Peter to simply throw his net on the other side of the boat after he fished all night and caught nothing? Did it make any sense for Elijah to cut off and throw a stick in the water where an iron axe had, axe head had fallen and expected to float to the surface? So I'm going to ask you a question again. Are there times when God doesn't make any sense to me? And my answer is yes. Let's go a little farther. Does it make any sense that you can take a piece of fabric, pray over it, put my son anointing oil on it, and then put that fabric or the apron and place it on somebody that and the demons would leave them and their bodies would be healed. Does that make any sense? Yes. 
Does it make any sense in your mouth? You can say, in Jesus' name, I'll draw a bloodline, and demons have to stop in their track and can't cross that bloodline. Yes. You see, I've learned something about God. What we want from God is sin, but what God wants from us is faith. God is not a sense God, church. He's a faith God. And walking with God is not a son's walk. It's a faith walk. And listen, if you're trying to understand God with your carnal mind, your, your, your carnal nature, the Bible says the things of God are foolishness to the natural mind. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes we've missed our greatest blessings, our greatest breakthroughs in our lives because we wouldn't do or we wouldn't say, or we wouldn't go where God said because it didn't make sense. We want God to be logical. He wants us to be obedient. We want God to explain everything to us before we're going to move. But God wants us to move without explaining everything. God told Abraham, I want you to leave your family, I want you to leave your country, and I want you to go to this place. He didn't sit down and explain everything out to Abraham that was going to happen. He just told Abraham to go, and Abraham went. And the Bible says because of his faithfulness, because he trusted God, he was, it was counted as righteousness under him. And you know, there, there may be a possibility that there's some scientific equations or hypotheses that went into the walls of Jericho coming down. There's a possibility that scientifically somehow the continued blowing of the ram's horn and the single stored up shout created a massive uh, sonic sound wave and disrupted the molecules that held the wall together and it fell. That's possible. But God didn't have a scientific conference with Joshua and explain to him all the scientific details of his commission. He just told him what to do and Joshua would get it. You see, when God tells you to do something that doesn't make sense, and you begin to rationalize, you begin to think about it, that's what the devil wants you to do. Because he'll sit there and give you all the reasons why not. Well, you're going to look foolish. What are people going to say about you? What are people going to think? How bad do you want what God has for you? I, you know what? When I was in the world and I was doing drugs and I was drinking, I made an idiot out of myself a lot of times, and I didn't care what people thought. Why is it when we get saved and we come to God, all of a sudden you're so worried about what everybody thinks? Most of them not going to think good about you anyway, no matter what you do. You might well go ahead and be obedient to God. They're going to talk. Listen, the Bible, what the Robert's talking about this morning, the Bible says we're peculiar people. Look at somebody tell them, you're peculiar. <laughs> Listen, this is how God works. He gives the orders, no explanation, and he leaves it up to you to obey or disobey. It didn't make any sense to me when God put Pastor Joy in my life. I was expecting this angel to fall out of heaven, already saved, already sanctified, already on fire for God. Because I'd already made a mistake, so I was waiting on God this time. And I was expecting this preacher's daughter. Instead, he gave me her, and it was a kind of a work in progress. <laughs> but God knew what I needed. It didn't make sense to me. I'm thinking, but God, she got up, like Joyce Myers said, she had a lot of work to do. And I'm thinking, God, but God knew what I needed, church. Amen. And I'll just be 39 years, but 39 years later, God put it in. Amen. It's possible there was some kind of healing ingredient in that mud in the Jordan River that attacked leprosy. I said it's possible. But God did not explain it to Naaman. He just told him to go and dip. The point is God knows all the logistics, why he does what he does, the way he does, and when he does it. But he doesn't require from us logistic agreement. He just requires faith and obedience. I believe we're living in such a time that our very survival is hinging on the simple obedience to God's direction, even when they don't make sense. What the world's going through right now doesn't make sense. There's no common sense. The things they do seem so 
stupid, so backwards. But you know what? If we didn't go through what we're going through right now, many of us wouldn't be crying out to God like we're crying out exactly. to God. Exactly. Amen. God's going to turn these things around, church, and you're going to see. And he's going to get the glory for it. Amen? Amen. Amen. In the last two years, it seems like we've been in a roller coaster in this country. Many times we haven't been able to make sense of what God's been doing or not doing, church. I believe God has allowed us to feel that way, to bring us to that place where we can walk in simple obedience, what God calls faith. You know, he said we're supposed to have childlike faith. A child doesn't know how you're going to feed them. They just look at mom and daddy and know you're going to feed them. They don't know how you're going to take care of them. They just trust mom and dad to take care of them. They don't question. So many times we come to God and we question everything. With God, I think you need to do this way. I think you need to use this people, this person. I think you need to. We want to put God in the box. Church, quit putting God in the box and let God be God. Amen. I'm going to share this little story with you. A pastor said when he was a kid, when we were kids, every so often our dad would play a game with us. We took the same route to church and home two or three times a week for years. So we thought we could tell where we were at without looking. So we closed our eyes and dad would start driving. And we began to navigate the route telling God where we are on the route based on how fast or how slow we were going. And we did pretty good. So we'd say, we're at such and such place. And he'd say, no. And we'd be confused because we thought we knew the way it was supposed to go. And we did. But what we left out was the equation was dad never told us he was going to stick to the route. Even though we knew the route we'd taken so many times, we weren't in the driver's seat. So we would be confused. We'd think, we can't get home. We don't know where it's at. And then dad would laugh and he would say, just trust me, I'll get you home. Even if it's not the route you're used to or you're familiar with, he said, I know where I'm going. This story is powerful, I think, because God is saying the same thing to us. He's saying, if you just trust me, I'll get you home. I'll get you through whatever you're going through. I know where I'm at. I know where I'm going, even if you don't. And the story finishes this. So sometimes we get aggravated at Dad because he wasn't keeping to the route. How many times have we got aggravated at God because he's not keeping the route that we planned for? Oh, God, if you just do this, it would be so much simpler, so much easier. But would it accomplish what God wants to accomplish you? See, sometimes when we take the shortcut or we do it the easy way, we don't learn anything. And we find ourselves going around the mountain again, going through the same thing over and over and over. God's way is above our way. The Bible says his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Amen? We're going to close our eyes and tell God where to go and what to do based on what we're comfortable or familiar with. How many times have you been around somebody, well, we don't do that in our church? Or we never did it like that. Because we want to keep God in the box. Church, this is my heart's desire. I'm standing in the house of God. I want to see a day where I don't have to come up and preach a word. Amen. I want to see when we get to praise and worship that you get so in contact with God that the power and the presence of God just fills this body up and people, everybody in here is going to be touched yeah. and changed by the power of God. These are not my mind, nor the power, but by my spirit. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. The church is going, he was talking about this morning, it's going to happen when we get one mind, one accord. Yes. Quit coming in here and worry about what happened yesterday and what may happen tomorrow. I'm in the house of God. I'm here to lift you up and glorify you and to receive from you. Come on. When we get that focus on, on, you watch what God right. does. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I'll come through. Yeah. Listen, if we can ever get this principle, it's going to be awesome. Because we realize it takes all the weight off our shoulder. We don't have to understand the mechanics or the scientifics. All we have to do is just do it. All we have to do is just trust and obey. Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. You know, there are a lot of people who are obedient, but 
they're not really willing. They do it because they feel like they have to. God said, I want you to do it because you want to do it. Amen. And if you do it because you really want it from your heart, he said, then you shall eat the good. That's his promise to you. Amen. I'll do it, but I don't really want to. <laughs> Sound like my son when I used to get over there. I'll do it, Dad, but I don't really want to. Listen. God says, stretch out the rod over the sea, Moses. But God, why? What's the logic behind that? Which end do I point? How long do I hold it there? What's the angle I'm supposed to hold it out? How is holding my rod over the sea going to affect the water? Could you imagine? How many times has God told us to do something? We've got so many questions. Listen, it's God telling us to do it. You think he doesn't know the beginning from the end? Yes. 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 Fill the water pots with water. But they're asking for wine, not water. And what do you tell them? Just do it. Didn't make any sense. I'm going to say something. As Christians, one of our biggest problems is not the devil. One of our biggest problems is why God why, when God when, and how God how. Amen. Amen. Yes. Right. Well, I shouldn't see no way. You may not see a way, but he said all things are possible to him that can believe. He didn't say it's all possible to him who understands. He said it's all possible to him who believes. There's an amazing little chorus. We've sang it here before. And this is what we should be saying to God. It goes like this. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, let. Yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord. I say this all the time, church. If you want God's results, you got to do things God's way. Amen. We want to do things our way, but we want God's results. And it doesn't work that way. What do you do when God doesn't make sense? When He doesn't move the way you want Him to? When healing comes in stages instead of instantly? When the financial breakthrough seems like it's never going to come. When the children you prayed for and went and travailed over seem farther away from God than ever. When you drop your ballot in the box and you don't get who you voted for. What do you do? What's the correct response? Well, I'm going to get mad at God. Well, that's going to do you a lot of good. You ever got mad at God before? Didn't accomplish anything? Sure didn't change God, did it? No. What do you do? You keep on praising Him. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. He said, Trust with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. It just don't make sense to me, so I don't want to do it. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge God. And then he'll direct your paths. Yes. When you don't understand, when it doesn't make sense, what do you do? You keep on thanking God. You acknowledge that he knows what he's doing. You trust his timing. The main thing is that we keep praising him because praise is the voice of faith. When you praise the Lord, you're saying, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I believe you. Absolutely. Amen. Because you're praising for what's already come. He said his promises are yea and amen. And God's promise is it's yours, it's mine. Just like he told him, I've already given you the city. Jericho belongs to you. But you've got to do this. But when you praise him, you're telling God, I believe you. I'm not doubting you. Church, 
Church, we can praise and be raised, and we can complain and remain. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. You need, your ones need to be praising God. You need to find out. If you're going through a financial situation, I'll tell you all the time, find you some scripture about finances. If you're going through a relationship, find you some scripture about relationship. If you need healing, find scriptures that you need on healing. Amen? Amen. And begin to thank God. Begin to, you know what most of our prayers consist of? Lord, here's my list. I need you to do this, 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 and this. Even in our prayers, when you pray, find the word and pray the word back unto God. Get in agreement with God and God and the Holy Spirit will move on that word. Yeah. He's not moving on your tears. He's not moving on your fears. That's right. He moves on his word. Yes. You need healing? The Lord, I thank you by Jesus Christ. We were healed. Begin to praise God. Begin to thank God for it. Amen. You need finance. Lord, I thank you. You said you supply our needs according to your riches, Lord. By Christ Jesus. It just doesn't look possible. God loves the impossible situation. That's when he shows up and men don't get the glory because nobody can do it but God. So he gets the glory for it. Yes. Amen. Amen. Listen, sometimes God's going to tell you to march. Sometimes God's going to tell you to stand still. Sometimes God's going to say, be quiet. Sometimes he's going to tell you to shout. Sometimes he's going to wait for the waters to part. Sometimes he's going to tell you to run into the battle. Sometimes he's going to wait for the, the mobile rustling of the mulberry tree. Sometimes God's going to say go. Sometimes God's going to say stay. Sometimes he's going to say yes. And sometimes he's going to say no. And sometimes he's going to say not right now. Sometimes God, what God tells you will be the most illogical move that could possibly be made. In Joshua chapter 3, the Jordan River is at flood stage. God said, I'm going to take you across. Joshua said, hallelujah. How are you going to do it? God said, tell the priest to bear the ark, to take off their shoes and with the ark on their shoulders and wade out into the raging floodwaters. Can you imagine? It's flooded rivers. And God said, take off your shoes and march out there into it. You can almost hear Joshua say, that don't make any sense. God, you have a plan B. You ever told God that? Lord, you sure there's not some other way we can do this? But Joshua obeyed, and the priest stepped in, the water parted, and they crossed to the other side. Amen. I don't know what crazy, illogical thing God may be asking you, but I can tell you this. Your miracle, your healing, your breakthrough is on the other side of obedience, even when it don't make sense. Yeah. Amen. But make sure it's God telling you to do it, church. Because a lot of times we do a lot of crazy things and God is not in it. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 3 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own instrument, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. When life don't make sense, it's because we don't understand our, our circumstances. So Solomon tells us not to lean on our own understanding because our understanding is limited. We don't get to see things from God's perspective. We don't get to see God's plan and purpose for our circumstances. That's why we got to simply trust that God has a plan and purpose for everything that we encounter. It will acknowledge that God is with us in the good times and the bad times. Church, you'll see you through. How many times have you don't even have to raise your hand? How many times have we been in situations we didn't know what we was going to do, didn't know how we was going to get out of it, and all of a sudden God showed up and He turned things around. And it just blew our minds because it didn't make any sense. Amen. But yet God still made it work. Genesis 50 says, but Joseph said to him, Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. It didn't make any sense. Joseph's brother selling him into slavery. Then he got in charge of Potiphar's house and she falsely accused him. And then he got thrown in prison. <coughs> and then he deciphered he just, uh, just a dream that a baker had and told him, don't forget me. And when he went back to the king, they forgot him for two years. He still stayed there. 
None of that made sense. But had Joseph not gone through what Joseph went through, his heart would not have been where it needed to be. And when his brothers came before him, he could have had all of them killed. But he says, don't worry about it. I'm in the place of God. Amen. Yes. What about you? But I want to be in the place of Absolutely. God. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. He said, you've been it for my evil, but God turned around and made something good out of it. How many believe God in the bad place you're in right now? How many believe God can turn that around and make something good? Amen. Amen. Because he was in the right place when his family came, he not only saved his family, he saved the nation of Egypt too. Because he stored up for seven years when there was plenty of for the seven years when there was little. <laughs> God had in the right place at the right time, church. Amen? Amen. John 11, and I'm almost through. John 11, 43 says, When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who died came out, his hands beat down with linen strips, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said, Unbind him, let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, had seen what he did and believed in him. It didn't make any sense for Jesus to wait four days until the man stunk. And then he shows up. And the sister says, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. If the brother had not died, Jesus would never have been able to call him forth out of the tomb. And the people would never have been able to see him do that. And they wouldn't have believed him. Sometimes, church, we're going to go through some things. There's going to be some times in our life that may stink, but God wants to use that for his glory. He wants to turn around so you'll be a, a witness and you'll have a testimony. Yeah. Oh, I want a testimony. Then get ready for a test. Well, I want no test. You won't get no testimony. I want to be victorious. That means get ready for a battle. Well, I want no fight. Well, then you're not going to have no victory. Amen? Mark 4.37 And a great windstorm arose and waves were breaking in the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a cushion and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he woke, rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. And he said to him, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? When life doesn't make sense, when we're prone to fear, just like the disciples in this boat, notice the question, don't you care that we're perishing? How many times, have we, God, don't you care? Don't you see what I'm going through? God, why are you letting this happen to me? But after Jesus calmed the storm, he identified the root of their fear with a lack of faith or a lack of trust. You know, when you're worried that's what you're doing, you're not trusting God. When we get into fear and worry, we're not trusting God. You see, faith and fear are the opposites. One increases, the other decreases. When your faith is up here, then your fear is down here. And when your faith is down there, then your fear rises up to here. Last scripture, Revelation 21. So then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, or crying, or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the good news is that no matter what happens to this life, it's only temporary. The tears you shed today will be wiped away. The pain you feel today will be long gone. God will make things new and will be with the Lord forever. Your life may not make sense right now, but remember that pain won't last forever. Amen. There will come a day when God will make all things new, and on that day, it will all be worth it. But for now, just trust that God has a purpose in the pain. Amen? Amen. I'm going to close on this. Because he is going to make it all new. Because some things we go through don't make sense. 
Sometimes God doesn't make sense to us. But do this. Dance as though there's no one watching. Love as though you've never been hurt. Sing as though no one can hear you. And live as though heaven is on earth. Amen? Amen. I hope y'all got something this morning. This Amen. It's not going to make sense. Amen. Amen. Quit trying to make God explain everything. You know, it, let me say this before I do close. If God were to tell us everything, sometimes we wouldn't want to do what he told us if we knew what was going to happen down the road. Which is but every step is step to step. God tells you to do this, do what he tells you to do. And you watch. You'll find yourself in the place of God. Amen? We're going to play a song. We're going to have an altar call and we'll have prayer. Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit minister.